So normally, whenever we interact with people, at that time, we have, between us and the other person, is our attitude, our emotions, our overall way of looking at that person. Between each one of us, this we are not talking about a physical space between us, but we are talking about what either connects or disconnects us from others. So, so broadly speaking, if we say that I am here, the others, other person is here. And in between, our attitude can range from naivety to cynicism. Now, naivety, na when a person is naive, that means they are very gullible. They, uh, they don't think, they don't evaluate very much. So a naive person may think that everyone is a good person. Everyone is trustworthy. Everyone is wonderful. Everyone speaks the truth. So if we are going to some, we are going to buy something. And if you are naive, then we might well get cheated. Something might be worth $50, but we might end up paying 100 or even $500 for that. So if you are naive, then that is a problem, any kind of interaction. But when we are cheated or when we are let down, we are betrayed, at that time, we might respond by going to the other extreme. And the other extreme is cynicism. Cynicism is where whatever anyone does, we ascribe the darkest motives to that person's actions. So we think nobody is trustworthy. Nobody is a good person. A typical attitude of cynical people are, is that there are only two kinds of people who are good in the world. Those who are not born and those who are in their graveyard. <laughs> Sorry, that's that's true. That's true. <laughs> okay. So now, if we look at it from the Bhagavad Gita's philosophy, inside us we have a mind and an intelligence. Now, sometimes we think of the mind as bad and the intelligence as good. But it's not necessarily like that. Both are required. The mind is associated with emotions, the intelligence is associated with reason. And both are required. So in, in naivety, we are going too much according to our emotions. Like some people are too emotional and some people are too rational. So being too emotional, we oh, I like this person, and then we just get carried away by those emotions. So when the emotionality becomes extremely high, that's when we go into naivety. And when the rationality becomes too high, then we go into towards cynicism. Because if we just try to be rational all the time, then we can't ultimately relationships is not just it's not just based on the rational agreement between two people. It is based on a emotional bond between two people. And sometimes when we talk about relationships, it's not just say the male-female relationship, any kind of relationship in our office we might have some colleagues. Some people we just bond with them. And some people, no matter how much we try, it's everything that we do, it seems to annoy them. So now, why does it happen? You can't really rationally give a list. I'm, we can say, that I'm very close to this person. Okay, that's nice. Can you explain why you're so close to that person? We might come to some reasons. We might be able to come up with some reasons, but those reasons in themselves are not enough. In the sense that we might be able to come up with some other person for whom all those reasons apply, for whom all those reasons apply and still that person is, we don't like that person so much. So basically, for forming a relationship, we need to have a balance. It's not only naivety driven by emotions and not only rationality which can lead to cynicism. 
at one level being being a, ha- having a certain amount of reason is important otherwise we'll be cheated but having only reason the problem with that is that you can always find out bad things of people this person this fault this person this fault this person this fault actually we can say that you may one of my uh friends you will give a resolution you are saying that i made resolution i will not find faults with my spouse and that's a interesting resolution okay <laughs> <laughs> so then so i asked him after a month or two what happened i said i he said that i discovered a easy way to do this so what is the easy way i realized that there too many faults to count <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> that is <laughs> that is a wrong way of going about it <laughs> but no actually skepticism and cynicism skepticism is so in some ways desirable but cynicism is an extreme version of that so cynicism can only tell us what is wrong it can never tell us what is right so you could see the rational faculty if you are driving a car then the capacity to evaluate the capacity to doubt that is also helpful that is like the brake in a car the emotional faculty is like the gas the accelerator so we like someone oh we can bond with that person so quickly so if we have a, if we the, the way they, the way they view the world the way they feel about things the way they the attitude we just bond with them so the emotional faculty is like the accelerator whereas the rational faculty is like the brake and for driving a car properly both are needed if the car has only a brake and no accelerator and we keep pressing the brake the only thing that will happen is yes, the car will make a lot of noise and consume a lot of fuel but nothing more will happen beyond that so if somebody is too rational they can keep finding faults with everyone but ultimately what is the use of that there was a atheistic philosopher uh, he was asked do you believe in hell and the expert obviously he is atheist and believes in yeah of course i believe in hell really he says what is your conception of hell is hell means other people and that is his idea hell means other people <laughs> Okay, I will mean, be. Yeah, that's all. So I don't know whether he said that, but it's an implication. That's a good one. <laughs> so some people might ex- ex- experience a lot of adhibhuti klesh, the uh, s- distress because of the people around us. That might become a lot, and when that happens, we might get into that zone where we, people are bad. But then. ultimately if we consider that other people are hell then we sentence ourselves to loneliness because we can have no relation we can have no uh, real relationship where we open up and we see these two extremes in today's world where many times young people just rush into relationships and they say that okay i saw this person i met this person and we fell in love with each other and then after that they stay together they come together they uh, they there for some time and the same speed with which they got attracted to each other after they can say this speed they can repel from each other so what is happening over there they are driven only by emotions and sometimes we are attracted to the other person sometimes we are repelled from the other so it doesn't last for very long but then what happens even they get one bad experience next time they emotionally attract to someone else they get attracted to that person okay. and this just can go on and on and on and if this happens repeatedly eventually they get so frustrated they feel just i don't want anything to do with anyone so 
We need a balance between these two. We can't have naivety and we can't have cynicism. So how do we go about this balance between us and others? So I'll talk about this based on a story from the Ramayana. And then we'll come to what comes in between is trust and how we develop that trust. Are any questions or comments till now? Yeah, you can write and give also, or you can, I think I've been given checks all of you, so you can use that. So, throughout the talk, I'll stop in between, uh, maybe two, three, two, because this is seminar, so I'll stop and if you have questions, you can ask, and at the end also we'll have time. Okay. So, the Ramayana is essentially a book of relationships. It's a, uh, there's a lot of action, and there's confrontation, there are wars, but essentially it's all about relationships and how some relationships work, how some don't work. Now, I talk primarily, there are, there are many uh, brothers in the Ramayana. How many pairs of brothers do you, can you think of in the Ramayana? Two. two brothers. Who are the two? Ram, Lakshman, that is four brothers actually. Yeah, four. Ram, Lakshman, Bharat 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 yes, they are cousins, but more or less brothers only. Wali and Supreme. Yes, Wali and Supreme is one more set of brothers. Rav and then Ravan, Ravan, Divisha, Kumbhakarna, yeah, three brothers. And, and among the monkeys, there are two more sets of brothers, Mainda and Vivida. Yes. They are the sons of the Ashwini Kumaras. So the Ashwini Kumaras are two and then their sons are also two. So there are many brothers, but these three are prominent. Now if you see, <coughs> among these different brothers, the relationships that Ram, Lakshman and Bharat Shatrabhara, they are close to each other, very close to each other. All four are very close to each other, but they are especially close to each other. And there is no, there is no long-lasting misunderstanding between them. Well, when Ram is sent to the forest, at that time Lakshman feels very angry with Bharat. Because he feels that Bharat might be behind the conspiracy done by Peggy. But when Bharat comes and offers and begs to Ram to come and uh, come back to the kingdom, at that time Lakshman's suspicion disappears entirely. And Bharat finally begs, please, if you don't come, then I want the world to know that I am not the king, you are the king. So, in my heart, you are my lord, I am your servant. But I want the position in the court to reflect the disposition in my heart. And therefore, please give me some symbol that will represent you and put that on the throne. And I will sit below at a lower seat. So, what does Ram give at that time? His padukas. Now, today, if one brother gave his footwear to another brother, other brother tried to take it and bang his back on the head. <laughs> so, <laughs> there is no long lasting misunderstanding. Although, circumstantially, some, some little conflicts do come up, but they are very minor. If you see among the, these four brothers, among, the, uh, among Ravan, Kumbhakarna, and Vibhishan, it is that Vibhishan is. All three are born in demoniac family, uh, family but Vibhishan is very much of a devotee. Ravan is totally a demon. Kumbhakarna is also demoniac. But Kumbhakarna is not blinded by desire as Ravan was. So Kumbhakarna at one level tries to, he reproaches Ravan. You made a big mistake by abducting Sita without consulting us. After Hanuman has come and destroyed half of Lanka and gone back. So at that time, uh, Ravan calls a full assembly of war to discuss. Because the fortress which he had thought was impregnable had been not only penetrated but also devastated by a single monkey. And so, sorry. Yeah. Single monkey can destroy so many 
Yeah, a single monkey has done so much. So what? So he's alone. And at that time he talks with his various generals. And all the generals, they just... Uh, they just... Uh, are like his yes men. So they say, actually, you know, Hanuman caught us by surprise. If we had, if next time if he comes again, it is he will who will be in for a surprise. We will have our full power to exhibit. So the Kumbhakarna says, oh, oh Ravan, you are asking me, asking us what to do now. Why did you ask us before you abducted Sita? So that is because of that. A uh, short rash act, you have put all of us in danger. But, now Pravan is a, he's a king and he doesn't like to be, see nobody likes to be reproached publicly. And especially somebody who is the position of a king. But Ravan knows that he needs Kumbhakarana, so he just tolerates. So you know, there are different kinds of toleration. There can be sometimes we tolerate someone because that person is speaking something which is good for us. And we need their guidance. So tolerance is sometimes you should learn to tolerate. And some people say I just can't tolerate. I was in I was in Australia. I did a seminar in uh, <coughs> in Brisbane on burn anger before anger burns you. So there you're talking that some people uh, some people say that I just can't control my anger. Okay, so somebody says that I just can't control my anger. Okay, so say, say, tomorrow you go to your office and you're about to leave from your office and your boss gives you some extra work. So will you feel angry? Obviously. But will you yell at your boss? He says, no. Why not? He says, no, I can't yell at my boss, he'll fire me. So that means you have the capacity to control your anger. It's, it's, it's the emotion of anger is there, but the action of anger is not happening. So what happens with respect to emotion? There is delayed action. That means you don't yell at the boss, you come back home and yell at somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so it's <a> delayed action. <laughs> but essentially, all of us, when the emotion comes up within us, if the more we are aware of the time, place, circumstance, the more we can regulate that emotion. So that capacity to regulate emotion is there within all of us. So as a Ravan we consider he's a demon, he's not like a completely uncontrolled demon. He reigns his anger, he controls his anger and he says he, uh, he just controls himself because he needs Kumbhakarana. So basically there is an emotion of whatever anger or whatever is there within us, but there is our awareness of the need of something. So I, if I need my boss to give me a job, if I need my boss to give me a favorable report, uh, so for a favorable appraisal, then even in, no matter how angry I am, I'll speak politely. So Rahul keeps himself under control. And then Kumbhakarna says that, now, oh Ravan, it is your fortune that you have a brother like me who will protect you from your mistakes. So, you have made a terrible mistake by Dr. Sita, but I will protect you, don't worry. Now, this is based on, so he has some understanding of Ram's power. That's why I feel this is a mistake. So, you see, Ravan initially is completely dismissive about Ram's power. He says, Ram's power is nothing, my power is everything. Kumbhakarna, he understands that Ram's power is great, but he thinks, my power is great. Whereas Vibhishan, he understands that Ram's power is great and anybody else's power, in contrast, is nothing. So, here, that means, what happens is that all, the, all three are brothers, their views are different. And this understanding of, so, Ravan underestimates the opponent and overestimates himself. Kumbhakarna properly estimates Ram, but still overestimates himself. Whereas Ambition, he properly estimates Ram and he properly estimates himself also. Himself means all the other Rashadam, the Rashadam power in general. 
So basically, here also there were differences, and these differences are such that they couldn't be reconciled at all. In the sense that Vishnu went over to the side of the Ram, uh, of the of Ram, and Kumbhakarna and Ravan were eventually killed in the war. Now, if you consider the other set of brothers, Vali and Sugri. So among the among Vali and Sugri, so they were they were brothers and they were very close to each other. So they were so close to each other that they could give up their life for the other person. Whenever they would go to fight for a war, they would go together always. So they were what you could say, awesome to some. The two of them were awesome together, and they were any demons, any attackers. To Kishkinda, they fled on seeing these two powerful uh, monkeys. But then, unfortunately, a series of things happened by which Wali turned against Sukriva. Um, I won't go into that story in detail. But basically, Sukriva thought that Wali has been killed by a demon and he covered the cave. So, what happened was that Mayavi was a demon who had come to challenge Wali. And Wali came out to fight, but Sugri also came with him. Now, when Maya thought these two monkeys have come together, I can't fight against both of them. And he fled. It was not that both of them were going to attack him together. But what they thought was that if Maya has got some other demons with him, then uh, Sugri can take care of them. Other demons are very tricky, they can attack from the back also. They may not follow war ethics. So Sugri was there, but Maya fled, and Wali decided that. This Maya, we will come again and again, so we will give cheese and catch him and challenge him and curb him. So Maya kept fleeing and fleeing and finally realizing that he just couldn't run away. He was passing by and he saw a cave and he ducked into the cave. And that cave was not just one cave, it was like a cavernous network of paths underground. And when Bali noticed that, he says, I'll go inside, you stay outside, don't so you. Now Sukri said, let me also come inside, he says, no. If he tries, there is some other way by which he comes out, you catch him over. You don't want him to escape. So then Bali uh, went inside. And for a long, long, long time, Sukri was waiting. And there was no sound at all coming from the cave. And finally, he heard the roaring, the screaming, the shrill yell of the demon. But he didn't hear any sound from and I was waiting, waiting, waiting. There was no sound from Bali at all. And then he thought, Bali has been killed. And then he started thinking, if this demon is so powerful that he can kill Bali, I won't be able to stop him. And then he can terrorize, he can not only kill me, but he can destroy our whole kingdom because our kingdom will have no protector if both of us are killed. So he decided that if I can't fight the demon, let me trap the demon. And he got a huge boulder from nearby and pushed it with all his strength. And he found the right boulder so that the boulder almost completely covered the door, entry to the cave. And it was just covered like, it would, for him itself from outside also, it was very, very difficult to move, to put it in position. And then he went back. So when he went back, there was a statewide period of mourning, the king had been killed. And then, the courtier said that our kingdom needs a king. And Angad was too small at that time to be a king. So then they decided that oh, Sukri will be enthroned as the king. And many days later, suddenly they heard the thunderous footsteps. And as there, the shouts of alarm from outside the palace and suddenly they saw Wali coming in with bloody shot eyes, furious. So at that time, as soon as Wali came in and he saw Sukri sitting on the throne, he charged towards Sukri. Now Sukri was initially delighted, oh Wali is alive. But then he understood quickly what has happened. So Wali, when he came out of the cave, Wali had been basically fighting inside. And because it took a long time for him to search, to find the demon, he, he was also tired. So he didn't waste any of his energy in yelling or screaming or roaring. 
He just silently did his job in killing the Maya demon. But when he came out, he thought that how is this stone got, boulder got, cave got closed? And the way it was positioned, he felt that this cannot just be an accidental landslide by which the boulder came over here. It's been precisely positioned. So who has kept it here? Oh, he said, well, is there some demon who came and killed Sukriva? He said, no, but if the demon could have killed Sukriva, then why would he block? A demon could have come in and attacked me. And Sukriva would have called to me. I would have heard and I would have come out with this. So I was thinking, thinking, was pushing, pushing, pushing. And it, because it was, he was pushing from below, it was much more difficult to push. But after great effort over several days, finally managed to open. And he came out and he saw there was no sugri and there was no sign of any scuffle, no sign of any violence. So then that suspicion started becoming bigger and bigger. Did sugri try to drag me over here so that he can get the kingdom himself? And when he saw Sugriva sitting on the throne, his suspicion was confirmed. So then he started attacking Sugriva and Sugriva tried to explain. But you know, when we are angry, what, ha what happens is anger gives us a certainty of conviction that tolerates no opposition. It's a, it's, you know, faith is good in many ways, but sometimes certainty, I'm certain this is how it is, certainty is not so good because sometimes the reality may be different from what we think. So, so there is, um, there are two kinds of people in the world, you know? there are two people, there are people, there are people who are wise and they are full of doubts. Maybe this is not like this, like this, like this. And there are people who are foolish and they are full of confidence. <laughs> this is how it is. So both are undesirable. To be foolish and cocksure. Yes, I know how it is. And to be wise and doubtful. Both are undesirable. And unfortunately what happens is people who are too wise are too much thinking, thinking, thinking. They become doubtful. Maybe this like this, maybe this like this. They can't have a clear, lot of clarity. There is something called overthinking. You know, people who overthink, you know, they say that. You know, earlier I was confused. Now, I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> that means, now I'm not so sure about whether I'm confused also. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> so, that kind of overthinking losing to indecision, confusion is undesirable. But an like, unthinking conviction, this is how it is. That's also very unhealthy. So what happened? Uh, there is, you know, humility means to acknowledge the complexity of reality. Humility means to acknowledge the complexity of reality. To have doubts about the certainty of our conceptions of reality. And this is how this is. It may not be like that. So unfortunately, what anger does is, anger that gives us an unwarranted certainty about, of our, about our opinion. So, when we have that kind of certainty, then we just don't listen to any other perspective. So, some people are so arrogant, they say, there is an argument going on, they say, I can agree with you, but then both of us will be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that means, <laughs> it's a given that you are wrong, <laughs> so there is no point in agreeing with you. <laughs> so, Sugriv, now, now Bali, he had such something, he didn't allow Sugriv any opportunity to clarify. And Sugriv is trying to speak. Now, so Wali was 
while he was powerful and he was angry it's a deadly combination mm. to be powerful and angry a child or an infant gets angry then the infant may cry the infant may kick the infant may throw but there's not much strength but now powerful person they become angry they can get a lot of threats so they can do a lot of damage so sugri was trying to tolerate and clarify but see that while he was not ready to listen he just fled from there and for while what happened Sugriv's fleeing seemed like a further confirmation. If he's not wrong, why would he flee like this? And thus, eventually, Vali became so convinced that Sugriv has betrayed me. Sugriv is a traitor. And he started trying to kill Sugriv. Finally, Sugriv found a safe place near the Rishyamukh mountains where, because of a curse, Vali couldn't come. He was living there, but he was constantly fearful. What if somebody else comes sent by Wali, who will be, uh, who will be my killer, who will be an assassin? So he lived in fear. So what had happened for we could say Sugri? Initially, there was naivety. He says, "We are brothers. Why should he ever suspect me?" So. From Suvali's perspective, it seemed like an open and shut case. Sugriv has betrayed me. So he went towards cynicism. So he is naive in trusting Sugriv, but now the cynicism we could see is seen when in, Kish, in the Kishkinda uh, forests, Ram comes over there. And seeing Ram going to come enter into the forest, Wali, who is on top of the Rishanukhapar mountain, he just comes out of his cave, he sees. And he immediately becomes alarmed. He says, who are these people? Are they, they sent by by Wali? Sorry, Sugri becomes Sugri becomes suspicious that Wali are these people sent by Wali to kill me? And he runs back to the other monkeys. And then Jambavan and Haruman come out and say, Oh, Jambavan, says, what reason is there to be alarmed? He says they are just uh, Rishi Kumaras. He says no. He says that. You see, they are dressed like they are dressed like dressed like ascetics, but they are carrying bow and arrow. If you look at their body, the body is well formed; it's not like ascetic's body. So, what is going on? Now, it was intriguing, but it was not particularly suspicious. The Ram and Lakshman were not trying at all to conceal their presence. Ram was in distress and separation from Sita. And as you become overcome by emotion at times, and when they were walking, it was because they were walking without making an attempt to conceal their presence. That's how Sugriv had detected them. So if somebody is coming as an assassin, they would not come out so publicly, making noise like this. On top of that, generally, if somebody wants to make a sneak attack, then they blend into the woodwork. That means what they. They try to make I be as inconspicuous as possible. They try to look like everybody else so that they don't stand out. But here, by their appearance, they are standing out. So in a sense, you could say that there is suspicion that they are not wrong. They are not sent by Wali to assassinate me. That suspicion was unwarranted. But that suspicion did happen with him because by that time he had, he had lived in the forest. Survived many attempts by Wali to attack him, and he becomes suspicious. So, for all of us, there might not be anyone out to destroy us, but still, we can also become very. We can also go to the extreme of cynicism. Now, when the, between these two extremes is trust, and actually, trust itself is an act of courage. When we open ourselves to someone to trust them, it requires courage over there. And Sugriv, he eventually has that courage. So it is because he doesn't know Ram's intentions. We cannot see in anyone's hearts. So as the story moves forward, I'll come back to this point later. That how because of Hanuman's efforts, bridging efforts, Sugriv is able to put that trust in Ram. But naivety is where emotion is too much, uh, and then cynicism is where reason is too much, rationality is too much. 
in between is the courage by which we trust and for this applies not just in our relationship with each other it also applies in our relationship with krishna the courage to trust doesn't just mean that say when we start start practicing bhakti does god really exist does god really care is is practicing bhakti the way to connect with god even while we practice so that time we need courage to trust it is a uh, And similarly, when we are practicing bhakti, at that time things go wrong. Many things can go wrong in our spiritual life at any time, even materialized spiritual life. So to keep moving forward, we need this courage. So how we can develop that courage? That means last part of this or the major part of the seminar. But any questions till now? You are talking about. Uh... overthinking leading to indecisiveness or mm. confusion uh, <clears throat> and then we see others who don't think much they more into action um when you're in a scenario where you're observing this how do you know whether you're overthinking or uh, because i feel there needs to be a certain level of thought process uh, in being able to evaluate a situation um so how to know that we are not overthinking in the process of evaluating someone's action and at the same time have a thought process in doing what you're doing okay so how can we avoid overthinking about other people's actions but at the same time be thoughtful it comes by experience i think uh, that will be a major part of the subsequent class which we'll talk about the trust acronym but uh, broadly speaking it is that how do we know whether we give the example the accelerator and the brake now how do we know if we are on, if the car is driving properly if the car is going off course then the ride will become too rocky or we might just veer topple over we might just come to a dead end might crash into something if you are on the road the ride will be relatively smooth not only that if you look at the distance meter you know how far i want to go uh, if i am on the proper path the distance will keep going down 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 that will send it on the right track so basically the smoothness of the ride and the the distance from our destination those two are parameters that you can understand whether you are on the right track or not mm-hmm. now with respect to a uh, road by i talk about this side this little road we might be able to see a clearly delineated road okay this is the road and this is the wilderness around the road but within the in the road of relationship there is no clearly demarcated this is the road and this is the wilderness it's not demarcated but broadly the the as i said the param if we see that things are becoming very turbulent so if this is the road then if i am not moving forward at all despite putting a lot of time on the stage stuff over there it's still having a doubt about this not taking a step forward then it's then it's quite likely that we are overthinking about it so if you're not moving forward at all and if we are moving forward too fast then we will we will like us the experience jolts it's like when you go too fast the speed becomes too much and then in the one day what he was drive one body was being seated body was being driven by another body and this body was going way above the speed limit so then this body told me that when you go drive over the speed limit krishna leaves the car <laughs> <laughs> then whatever happens then not <laughs> sometimes sometimes people make mistakes and they say ultimately you know what jo hota hai bhagwan ki ichha se hota hai what ever happens happens by god's will well, it is not as simple as that krishna is the doer hmm? krishna is the doer krishna is the doer yeah <laughs> krishna is the one who is free will and it is for us to use the free will to choose responsibly so i'll say that if uh, the ride becomes a like rocky that means we just experience too many jolts in a particular relationship or if we just don't move forward at all that's the broad way we can understand whether we are uh, whether we are overthinking or 
not thinking at all. Yes, sir. So, Prabhu, when uh, based on personal experiences, if somebody is uh, uh, moved away from being naive all the time to being uh, uh, cynic, um, how easy it is to come back to this uh, platform of trusting? So, repeated uh, experiences. Okay, yeah. So somebody because of naivety and betray and disappointment has gone towards cynicism. Can they come back and how easy is it to come back to trusting? In general, the principle is that change doesn't take place as long as the the price of changing seems to be more than the price of staying where I am. So, <laughs> I'll repeat that. Say, if change doesn't take place as long as the price of changing seems to be more than the price of staying where we are. So, everything takes a price. If I'm cynical, that also takes a price. And the price of cynicism is loneliness. So, the, so generally, uh, to some to, to some extent, especially if we are around people who who at least there are some examples of working relation good working relationships among people around us. I say, you know, I would also like to have a relationship like that with someone. But if it's oh, everyone around us is lonely and isolated, I saw a car bumper. It says, "The more I get to know people, the more I love my dog." <laughs> so it's a it's a, some it's a, you know having pets. Some devotees are like, why do you have pets? It's an additional attachment. Somebody has a pet is a chandal and all that. People might say like that, but the point here is that having a pet, it's not a disease. It's a symptom of the disease. If somebody is coughing, coughing, coughing. Why do you cough so much? Why do you cough so much? It's so much noise. Well, there's no use criticizing the symptom of a disease. See, we have to cure the disease actually. So if somebody is, somebody's attachment is going in some healthy direction, then there's not much point in criticizing that symptom to address the, address the root. So, so if people see some functional relationships around them somewhere, then they at least have, I would also like to have that kind of relationship. And otherwise they'll just stay where they are. Because what happens, the price, if lonely, if everybody is lonely, then we, we think that is the way it is with everyone. And then the price of staying over there doesn't seem too much. But when we are around people who have good bonding on each other, we say, no, I'm losing all that much. So then what happens, then we become a little bit more open. So that's basically we have to, uh, rather than, rather than forcing someone to come out of their shell, we can actually help them see what exists outside the shell. Now what our riches exist outside the shell. And if people see that, and gradually they start taking steps forward. It will always be an incremental process. And there has to be a lot of uh, caution or required. But it's definitely possible. The key thing would be that the person feels the price of loneliness. Unfortunately, in today's world, people can get into social media and they can have pseudo relationships. So it is, you feel, oh, I have so many friends on Facebook. I have so many this, so many that. Now, how many of them? Now, <clears throat> the social media connections can be helpful to enhance or facilitate real connections. It's okay, I want to meet with someone, but when can I meet? How can we meet? All those logistics we can arrange. Some basic contacts we can have. But the social, the social media connections cannot replace real connections. And it's always easier to have a hundred superficial relationships than one deep relationship. Because what happens is in a hundred superficial relationships, uh, we are not 
exposing ourselves. In one deep relationship, we have to explain lower our guard. So it's very easy. Like many people, they they go out on the streets and they smile to everyone. They're polite. Good morning. How are you? And they come back home and snap at all their family members. Why is that? The stranger on the street, you'll never see them again. But you're polite with them. And people with whom you are going to live throughout your life are so rude and curt and so brutish with them almost. And that's because what has happened is that it's always easy to be our best in a superficial relationship. So with the stranger, we're not going to have much interaction, so it doesn't cost us much to be polite. But with a person with whom we are living constantly, there's so much baggage that is there within us because of the past, whatever has happened. So it becomes much more difficult. But uh, we have to overall um, recognize the importance of relationships. And then the change, the desire for change will come up. Does that answer the question? Yes. The question we have. Yeah. I, my question was, um, where does courage come from, and how does one develop it? Okay, I'll come to that. I think as we move forward. Yes. Uh, you mentioned about how we can get cynical sometimes with our relationship with Krishna as well, uh, and you uh, like gave an example as in like uh, sometimes we think if he's really listening to us or not, or you know like that. That just yeah, that's true. That tends to happen. Okay, yeah. So if you become cynical in our relationship with Krishna, does Krishna really listen to my prayers? Does he respond? What do we do at that time? That's why, especially relating with Krishna, philosophical understanding is very important. To understand how Krishna responds. In general, if we look at the world around us, Things are broken to make them better. If you look at the sky, the clouds might look beautiful. But unless the clouds are broken, there are no rains that happen. The clouds look beautiful in the sky, but they can't sustain in their life. So clouds have to be broken so that rains will come. Similarly, the ground has to be broken when it is flowed so that it can become can become suitable for agriculture, it can be something that is sown over there. Similarly, when grains come out, the grains have to be broken so that it becomes flour which is edible. And when we make chapatis, bread, whatever, it, it can look very attractive. Sometimes uh, travel devotees, they make prasad, the prasad arranges so artistically. And all the items are put in such a beautiful way that it feels as if it's, to eat this is to commit violence. <laughs> it's so, but you don't eat it, you'll not get the nourishment. So basically what we see is that in nature, things are broken to make them better. And sometimes Krishna also works like that in our lives. So we have certain plans, certain homes, certain dreams, certain dreams. And they may, be, they may need to be broken so that something better will emerge out of it. Now we have to always make a choice. Either we can say that there is no God and things just happen arbitrarily or that there is a God and things happen for a purpose. Now the problems of life are anyway there for everyone. Atheism does not solve any problems. Atheism does not remove any problems. It only removes the hope that the problems have a purpose. So what are we left with? Uh, there are some atheists who just criticize religious people. You are so foolish, you believe in this such stupid thing, you believe in that, you believe in that, you believe in that. But then, those who are really serious atheists, serious atheists, they really think deeply about what is the implication of atheism. Uh, they are profoundly pessimistic. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche was a philosopher who said God is dead, in, in spite of family declaration. But he had said that Life is miserable. So the best thing is if you were never born. The second best thing is if you die when you are very small. 
And he says, the worst thing that can happen to you is, you have a long life. <laughs> what a terrible way of looking at life. There's another philosopher, Albert Camus, who said that, that life is miserable. For the only philosophical question worth asking is, whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow. <laughs> and he wrote many books, just to say don't commit suicide today. <laughs> So he had his own. Now these are, these are not like foolish people. They are brilliant people in their own ways. But their brilliance doesn't lead to a brilliant conclusion. Because what happens? If we reject God, what are we left with? We are still left with the problems of life. And we are left with? With no hope, no ultimate purpose. So basically, if you have a philosophical understanding that Krishna might that Krishna often breaks things to make them better. So then, that gives the purpose for us. So we are not so much afraid of pain per se. What we are afraid of is purposeless pain. Right? Like say we are walking on a street and somebody has put some thorn or some nail is there and a nail pierces into our foot. We are furious. Who put this over there? And irritated, angry, infuriated. But then after that, we might go to a clinic and there also somebody puts a needle into our foot and we pay them for that. So at one level you could say a thorn going in and a needle going in, the sensation might be the same. But the context is different. So it's not so much the, the sensation of something piercing our skin that troubles us. It's when that sensation, that painful sensation has no meaning. That's what troubles us. So we may not know for what purpose this is happening. But there is a purpose for it. There is some, some growth, something better will emerge from it. If with that, with that faith we move on, then we can avoid that cynicism. Okay? But that's just uh, like out of what you had told earlier, that's just one thing that, um, that I had to say, Prabhu. But how else like, can we be cynical? I mean, what else can mean that we are being cynical in our relationship with Krishna? Oh. Okay, okay, so that is a different question. Mm. You could I was just, yeah, I was trying to say that you mentioned, uh, like, uh, I don't know, yeah, so I was just. Uh, and you could uh, yeah, If ever it happens, you know, if I don't, I'm, if I'm answering a different question from what you asked, please tell me in advance. <laughs> okay, so in what ways can we be cynical? in our relationship with Krishna. Yeah, one thing is to think that that spiritual life or spiritual principles are impractical. We may say, okay, they are difficult for me to apply right now, but that doesn't mean they are completely un unachievable. So if we just think, oh, this remembering Krishna is impractical. Okay, it might be impractical for me, uh, maybe constantly. But at least when I come to the temple, I can remember Krishna. At least when I'm in front of the deities, I can remember Krishna. When I'm chanting, at least for some time, I can remember Krishna. So think, to think that remembrance of Krishna is impractical, that is, that is also one way of being cynical. To think that yes, nobody is a pure devotee. Yes, now it's possible. We don't, we don't, can't go into anyone's heart and you can't say anything. So there are, I was at an interfaith conference and we were talking about cynicism. So there one Christian, he quoted him. says, the last Christian died 2,000 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so Christ was the last Christian. <laughs> okay, you could say that nobody may have the purity, the saintliness of Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that nobody has it. And for that matter, it's not necessary for our spiritual advancement that we need to have to meet a pure devotee only. Even if a devotee is a little more advanced than us, a little more dedicated than us, and even by their association, by their inspiration, we can move forward. So to think that there is no pure devotee at all, therefore, there is no one whom I should surrender to. No, there is no one. I don't need a guru at all. That is cynicism. Otherwise, cynicism might come in is to say that 
Oh, you, the, the different ways, many different ways actually. Some people may say, the scripture was written thousands of years ago. Who knows that scripture has been passed on as it is? Things may have changed. So, now, if you want to be cynical like that, you could be cynical about so many things. When we take a medicine from a super, from a medical shop, you could say that the medicine came from a manufacturer you know, thousands of miles away. How do I know that nobody slipped in the medicine, some fake medicine in between, in the same packets? According to surveys, at least in India, I read that one out of every five medicines is a fake medicine. So it's possible, quite possible. But then, we are not cynical like that. We take the medicine, and if it works, it's good. If it doesn't work, then we have some questions. So we see that Krishna, he spoke to the Gita to Arjun, and the result of the speaking the Gita with the Arjun <coughs> convince about sadhya and sadhana. That the supreme sadhya is Krishna and the sadhana is bhakti. Sadhya is Krishna and we get the about the condition was param brahma param dhamma param uh, parma bhavan. You know, he says that. But you are the supreme reality. And then karishya vachnam I will do your will. That's bhakti. So, as far as these two the core understandings of sadhana and sadhya, what Krishna what prophet hearing from Krishna Arjuna God that we see thousands and thousands of people in the world are getting it today by studying the Bhagavad Gita as well as Vaishya Prabhupada by getting connected with the Bhakti tradition even now so then we say okay I don't know about all the details but as far as the conclusion is concerned the essential conclusion whatever was the effect of that essential conclusion over there that is there today also so cynicism can come in anything that is that checks us from moving forward in our journey towards Krishna. That we can say is an effect of cynicism. It could be an effect of cynicism. Mm, okay, so let's move on now. So now, as I was asked, you know, how do we develop that courage to trust? So there are many aspects to it. And here I, I just will talk about five aspects. The first is think. T R U S T is the acronym which I'm discussing over here. So think means that like his Sugriva's so first response hey, was fear. Who are these people? But Hanuman told him to think. Think, what? No, they are not trying to hide at all. They are openly coming. They are not brandishing their weapons out to kill someone. They're harmless. So for all of us, when we have to open the door to our heart to connect with someone, so first is that we use our interviews to think. Now relationships may begin sometimes with emotions, in the sense that we just feel attracted to someone, which is okay. But if it is to be a steady relationship. I was in a university somewhere, I don't remember, I've been traveling for five, six months across the world. So anyway, somebody asked this question, uh, is love at first sight real? So I said, maybe or may not, what is important is, what is there after many sights? <laughs> <laughs> So, it may be sometimes some people might see each other and they get attracted, which is okay. But what happens afterwards is more important. The, what defines the beginning of a relationship is not necessarily the same as what defines the sustenance of the relationship. So, think means that we use our God-given intelligence. So, we will have, uh, we, every car, it needs an accelerator but it also needs a brake. So, we need, uh, we need <coughs> the thing means that basically, at least make sure that the brake is there, it's functioning. So, when we use our intelligence, basically what does using our intelligence mean? Prabhupada defines intelligence very nicely. It says to put things in their proper perspective. To, intelligence means to see things in their proper perspective. So, when we are not thinking, what our emotions do is, our emotions look at only one part of reality and make that the absolute reality. Like, 
happened to Ali, just took it one thing. No, that key was closed and he's sitting on my throne. He didn't think about anything else at all. So, if we naturally we look at the situation as it is right now, but we have to put it in proper perspective. Why might this have happened? Why might this person be like this? So if it considered Sukhriv, he had lived with Sukhriv for since his childhood. And Sukhriv had fought so many battles with him. Sukhriv had always been trustworthy. So at least he would have given some benefit of doubt. Think means that we use our intelligence to put things in their proper perspective. So don't take one perception to be everything. That one perception can lead to an irrational attachment or it can lead even to irrational aversion. Like sometimes some people, you know, they are talking with someone, they are talking with a group of people, and they go to great efforts to avoid looking at someone. They are looking everywhere, just try to avoid looking at the person. Sometimes we come to a temple or we come to some gathering, and then if somebody, we want to get that person here, we are angry with that person, and we go out of our way to avoid that person. No, okay, sometimes we might have negative interactions and we may want to keep a distance. But the point is that don't let one incident uh, take us, that define our whole worldview, define whole perspective, put things in the proper perspective. So thing is, okay, this is certain, this particular situation, this particular interaction will trigger certain emotions within me. But let me not go along only by that. I recognize that, but let me move forward. So with our intelligence, we see the we see things in perspective. Not just one perception determines everything. Now after that, R is resolve. Resolve means that whatever way we think, ultimately we can't know anything only by thinking. We have to act in the world. We have to take some action. So resolve means this is what I'm going to do. So for Wali and Sukri, what happened? So, in the case of Sukri, what happened? He made resolution. Let's, uh, Hanuman, you go and find out who they are. He sent Hanuman over there. Uh, now, Hanuman, of course, chose to take a disguise and go over there. But resolve means take some steps. You just live inside the head, it just doesn't work. You have to either take some steps forward in the relation, like take some steps, I'll come to that. That's also a step forward. But here, resolve means. What are you going to do? Okay, if sometimes if I, just, I don't think I can get along with this person, and there's no no reason for me to get close to this person, so let's keep a distance. If that's what you decided, that's fine. But if you decide, okay, this person, I would like to know them better. It resolve. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. Because see, the worst thing that we can do is that the mind. Sometimes you might be undecided. What to do? But there is indecision, which is a state of, of our mind. And there is indecision, which is the default state of the mind. That means people are always undecided about everything. Well, nobody in life can work with a guarantee of right decisions. Life doesn't come with a guarantee like that. We all Sometimes we make the right we make the right decision and sometimes we make the decision right. That means I made this decision. Now what, now what is the best I can do in this decision? So resolve we have to resolve means I have to take some course of action forward. If I don't take a course of action, I will never learn whether it is right or wrong. Say if it's if we are traveling through a completely snowy area, now I am on, I'm on the road. And everywhere I see snow only. So I don't know, this is, is this the road or is this the road? But this could be the road or this could be the... Mm, uh, this could be the road or this could be a way which might lead to a marsh or it might lead to a... Uh, off the road also. Now how do I do? I have to make some... If I just stay over there, I'm not going to go get anywhere. So resolve means, okay, this seems to be the road. Let me move forward. I didn't go at a high speed, but let me move forward. So we have to take some steps forward. Without that, we can't get any understanding. See, the, the head and the intelligence are required for understanding. But the head alone does not lead to understanding. We have to, our thoughts have to interact with the world practically. 
only then we can gain some understanding say another example could be that if i go to a if i have got some disease and then you go to a doctor and then the doctor tells you this is a diagnosis and then okay i take that medicine i may decide i don't want to take this medicine because it doesn't make sense to me so if we go to a doctor we have to think whether the doctor's diagnosis makes sense so suppose i have stomach pain and the doctor says we have to amputate your leg what <laughs> that doesn't make any sense <laughs> is it so i will mean, have to resolve it that time okay i can i cannot go i cannot i cannot uh, go to this doctor i cannot take the prescription with doctor then if you take some go to some other doctor but if somebody all oh, the doctor said this and for the next 6 months i keep thinking what the doctor said that i do not know whether to resolve or make some decision i was in stanford about a couple of months ago and i gave a talk over there and after that one american lady she came and she said my daughter has been studying at stanford for the last 12 years she said what is she studying she says she is still in the first year i said what happened? now to get to stanford she is not easy everybody has to be brilliant is what happened she says that for 12 years she has been changing her major to find out which should be the which is my uh, what is the word which what is my calling in life what is my calling what is my calling in life calling is you know what, what is it that i am inspired to do to discover one's calling you know to tell her this is way too much <laughs> most of her she said this is father was very anxious and most of her she, Peers, they are already in job, they are married, they are settled. And she is still in the first year of the years. Twelve years, just changed one. And you cannot go on like that. Life will slip by. So I say that sometimes uh, we can't wait for the best option. We have to work with whatever option comes and move on. And it's not that a person's career is defined only by their education. Your yeah, education is one part of your career. Say later on you discover that something else you interest, you can move forward from there. But don't let your life stop because you're not able to make a decision. So think and then resolve. This resolve is this is what I am going to do. So okay, I'll, but without thinking, I just ride along the ice, thinking this is the road. I might make a disaster because there might be a river which is frozen, and my car goes over there, the car will sink, the ice will crack and I'll sink. So I will think, but then I have to resolve after that. Okay, this, if I don't think it's not healthy, but if I don't resolve to do something, and that's also not productive, then you is what understand. Now, what is the difference between think and understand? Understand here refers to that when we do certain things, we have to have some understanding of what I am going to expect from this. It's like when I go to a doctor and take a medicine. What do I expect from that medicine? What should happen? Okay, my I got some pain. Doctor says. In three days, you take this medicine, your stomach pain will go away. Then I have to check: has that stomach pain gone away or not? So I have to have some framework by which I can evaluate what is happening. So understanding requires that we put things in the most constructive frame of reference. What do I mean by that? We put things in the most constructive frame of reference. Every single thing that happens. we could put that in many different frames of reference say for example right now this light goes off mm-hmm. now if this light goes off one we might look oh we might look back has somebody switched off the bulb switched off the, turned off the power switch if the power switch is still on and we say oh has this has the strip light got spoiled it's expired it come or say have has the power supply got cut off over here or we might say oh has the power grid here in this part of country collapsed or is it that canada has been attacked by terrorists and all power plants have broken down because of that or has there been a solar flare on the sun solar flares are supercharged discharges from the sun if they keep emitting from the sun but if a solar flare comes into the vicinity of the earth's atmosphere then all electrical and electronic devices on the earth will stop it's a, it's a, it can be a catastrophe it has not happened but they say it happens once in a century solar flare come into the earth's atmosphere 
So now you could see a simple light going off. Is it because of solar flares? Now you could escalate it at that level also. But we have to put things in the right frame of reference. And now we do it constantly. Uh, right, uh, right now say, if you start to be cold, where is it? Now you could say, hey, maybe, maybe this room is very cold. That could be one frame of reference. Maybe another thing will be, hey, I did not wear warm clothes. That could be another frame of reference. Based on what frame of reference we are putting it in, we will, the solution will be different. Say, if the room is cold, then you might, you might give feedback. We need more heating in this room. That's maybe you tolerate now, or you have more feedback. Next, if, you, if, the, if it's, others are not feeling cold, you are not feeling cold, that means I have to come with warm clothes. But if you have warm clothes, still you are feeling cold. Hey, have I got a fever? Is something wrong with me? So this, we keep doing constantly. We keep putting things in some frame of reference. But it's not always that we put things in the right frame of reference. So for example, say we told someone, uh, you know, we, we, are the, we are starting this program and can you please get the sound system over here at this time. And they don't come there with their sound system. When they don't come over there, we could, we could say, this person is irresponsible. This person is irresponsible, they are useless, they cannot trustworthy. So, another could be that, no, actually, nobody takes me seriously. Whatever I tell them, people don't do it only. Everybody treats me like a walkover. Everybody uses me, but nobody does anything. Or you could say, actually, people are not interested in this program. Nobody, there's no... So now, each of these three are different frames of reference. So first could be that I decide I won't spend so much time on that person. The second could be, should I be doing this service also? The third could be, maybe we should switch, shut down this program only. Nobody's going to come. So what happens, we all put things in different frames of reference. So I was at a spirituality and uh, mental health seminar in Connecticut. In the, the government had organized that over there. So I was invited. So they was talking about different people. So one of the care providers was telling me that he is a suicide intervention counselor. So he told me that he had got a call. I was talking about why different people commit suicide and what happens. So he was saying that he got a call from a girl after she had committed suicide. Not that, this, not that her host called, but that <laughs> she took the pills, poison, she overdosed of some poison pills, and then she said, no, I don't want to die. She called. Fortunately, they got a, the ambulance reach in time. And then, what happened? Uh, they, they, they rushed her and she survived. And he asked, you know, why did you come to suicide? So she said that, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm in a relationship with a boy, and I called him, and he didn't pick up my phone. Somebody doesn't pick up a phone, you commit suicide because of that. <laughs> That's so ridiculous, it might seem. But then he asked her, so what was she doing? She had put it in a particular, very self-centered frame of reference. It could be, so she thought that, oh, I called her, I didn't pick up. Maybe he doesn't care for me. Maybe he has left me. Maybe he's already with someone else. Maybe there's something wrong with me because of which nobody stays with me. Maybe I'll be alone throughout my life. And all my friends will be in healthy, happy relationships and they will see me alone and they will have pity on me. Oh, my life will be so pitiable. What is the use of such a pitiable life? Let me end my life. So what has happened is, from that, which frame of reference she put it in, from that it just went down the train of thoughts and she just went to suicide. So what happens, all of us in our relationships, we put people in a particular frame of reference. So, most often, when relationships don't work, it's, it's not very common that people go out of their way to hurt someone. There are, of course, some wicked people who get some joy in hurting others. But most people are not like that. So, when we, we feel a relationship is not working, 
it's often that there the frame of reference in which they are putting things and the frame of reference in which we are putting things are two completely different things or significantly different. So for example, it might happen that there's a parent and a child. The child, the child feels that you know, I was never loved by my father. And the father says, I did so much for my children, why are they so ungrateful? Now what happened is, it's like saying, a, another point, another way to understand this frame of references, we can consider currency. Say, if I give you something expensive, but I am using only INR, and you give me Canadian dollars. Now, I, have, I haven't seen Canadian dollars, and when I get Canadian dollars, what is this? You give me nothing. And you may say, I gave you so much more. Yes. So if two people are trading in different currencies, one person might give a lot, but the other person will say, I didn't get anything. So what happens in relationships, different people trade in different currencies. So the child, the father may say, you know, oh, I love you so much. Why, why son, he might get an expensive cricket bat and a cricket ball, cricket pads. You can, you can play the best. But the child may say, I don't want an expensive bat. But I want you to play with me. The child feels loved when the father gives some time to the child. But the father is thinking, I am showing love by giving things to the child. Now both of them are interacting. But what is happening? They are trading in different currencies. So understand means understand which currency people are trading. Understand what frame of reference they are coming from. It's sometimes when people people speak hurtfully to us, I would say almost 90 to 95% of the time, it's not about us. That means, they, that means there's something going on in their head. See, in everyone's head, a movie is going on. And in that movie, they are the stars. And everyone else is an extra. <laughs> everyone else is an extra. So what happens? That um, so when they get angry with us, it, it might not be about us at all. Like I said earlier, like delayed action. So they might be angry with someone else, and that anger comes out at us. Now, if we take that anger like personally, we might think of this relationship is not going to work. Maybe something is wrong with me. But nothing is wrong with them. Nothing is wrong with us. Nothing is wrong with the relationship. It's just that they are they are troubled over there. So you know, behind, in, inside. Every complaining or cursing adult is a crying infant. Inside every complaining adult is a crying infant. If you have a small infant and you pick up that infant, uh, infant baby and the baby kicks you. Now the kick will hurt. But you don't take the kick seriously. Because you know the baby is, baby didn't want to hurt you. The baby is simply in pain. And the baby just doesn't know what to do in that pain. So we try to figure out what's, what's wrong. What's wrong over here? And try to deal with that. So similarly, when we try to understand what currency people are trading in. So when people are complaining, people are cursing, people are doing all kinds of strange things, it's not necessarily, we don't have to put it in the frame of reference, oh, something is wrong with me. Because of which they are doing. It can be. You know, if, I, if I never think something is wrong with me, that's also not good. <laughs> but it doesn't have, no, we don't have to take everything that happens to us very personally. Many of the things that people do are not, with us also, are not about us. They are with largely going on with their head. If we try to understand what, what is the currency they are doing, what is the frame of reference they are putting it in. So for them, they may be yelling at us. But it's like we might have done a small thing wrong or we might have nothing wrong. But for them, the frame of reference is they had a hard day, 10 bad things happened in their day, and now what we did was the 11th small thing. But all that accumulated frustration of the past 10 things is coming out. And the frame of reference changes completely. So we have to put things in the most constructive frame of reference. So to understand what frame of reference somebody is coming from, or to understand what currency they are trading in. How do we do that? Broadly, two, two 
two observations we can make. Now, what is it that if we don't do, they complain a lot about? And what is it that if we do, they appreciate very much? So if you do, see, look at these two things. Sometimes you might feel that they're very small. Why is this person complaining so much? I was in DC last month, and I was in Sunday Fees class over there. After some person asked a question, he says, is it that women have a very long memory? I said, what do you mean? He says, you know, I did something in 1976, and my wife is still complaining about it. <laughs> <laughs> So there, I told you that means that rather than uh, think that why, why is she remembering such a small thing from so such a long time ago, you should say that whatever that was, that was important for her. You might say it is insignificant for you. Why are you making such a small thing so big? Yeah, it's uh, what has happened in the past should be left behind in the past. But if somebody is not able to leave it behind in the past, that means that was very important for them. So basically, as I said, to understand the currency means to understand if somebody is complaining constantly about something, it could be that they are just chronic complainers. That's also a possibility. That is, if somebody, some people, no matter how much you do for them, they are never satisfied. Okay. Then, you know, it might be impossible to have a very close relationship with them. But sometimes if there's one thing which they keep keep complaining about again and again, so say you just you keep nagging me about this. You just understand this is something very important for them. Then to understand, you can ask a more open-ended question. Can, can you explain why this is so important for you? I can see that you are you feel strongly about this. Can you explain why? And then if they explain, then oh, this is the case. The child, when the child feels unloved, my father says, I'm doing so much for you. But why do you feel unloved? He says, Oh, you never played with me. So that child feels loud when somebody plays with them. So basically, understand means, especially with respect to relations, understand what frame of reference, what is the most constructive frame of reference in which to put something. So right now this class is going on. And say, you could put this class, now suppose you start feeling, uh, start feeling tired. Now, one frame of reference you could put it in is that this subject is very complicated, I can't understand this. Another frame of reference could be the speaker is very complicated. Another frame of reference could be that I have no brains. <laughs> uh, another frame of reference could be that this class is going too long now. My brain has become overloaded. Another frame of reference could be that I didn't get enough rest last night. That's why I'm feeling tired now. So what happens is, we, the same thing, we could put it in different frames of reference. So there is no necessarily right or wrong frame of reference. It is the most constructive frame of reference. Constructive means what helps me to move forward, do something about it. So that is understand. And this is a very significant step to move forward. Whenever we are trying to have that courage to trust, we resolve to take some steps forward. But if things are working or they are not working, how do I know that? How do I understand that? I have to see the frame of reference, the currency in which they are trading. And then S is step forward. So it's sometimes some relationship might just, you could say, blossom rapidly. But in every relationship, it's like we have to take steps forward. So step forward, so far, now understand, going back to say Wali and that uh, Sugriva story, and Hanuman came over there and Hanuman asked, Hanuman had his own garb, he came first as a Brahmana, and then he talked, and then he understood, and he told Sugriva, he came back with Lama and Lakshmi Sugriva, and he said that, okay, actually they are princes, but they have been sent to exile. And because they are princes, they are having weapons with them, but because they are exiled, that's why they are wearing the garb and acid. So, okay, this is the frame of reference. They're not, they're not, why they used to kill. So you got the proper understanding. So we, are, we all put things in particular frames of reference, but we need to put them in the most constructive frame of reference. Step forward means that then when he heard 
that Hanuman, Hanuman, Ram told Hanuman and Hanuman and told Sudhir that he wants to form an alliance with you. And he, he, both of them were in similar situations. Both of them had lost their kingdom, you know, both of them had lost their wife for different reasons, but this was just, they formed an alliance and then they made a pact. They, both of them, Hanuman lit a yagya fire and both of them went around in that fire. Circumambulated it to signify the commitment over there. So step forward means that once we understand, okay, this is the frame of reference the person is coming from, then we take appropriate step to move forward. So the difference between resolve and step forward is that a step forward is with a greater understanding of what is happening. It is it is the more informed understanding of the dynamics of how that person thinks. When we take steps forward, then either way we will come to know the right thing. If something is working or something is not working. Once Prabhupada was in America and in New York and somebody asked a question, Prabhupada, Swamiji, your philosophy sounds like that of the Buddha. And Prabhupada said, do you follow Buddha? I said, no. So Prabhupada said, follow Buddha, follow Jesus, follow Krishna, follow someone, don't just talk. Don't just talk. If something is not right, we will come to know by following that it is not right. If something is right, we will come by following and come to know that it is right. So take steps forward. And lastly is time. Time means that we cannot know the nature of things just in a day or two. So it takes time to see uh, what is the actual reality of things. If after the after Wali was <clears throat> killed and delivered, then Sukhri became the king. And after that, for four months, at that time the Chaturmasya happened. And because Wali was the son of Indra, uh, Indra got very angry because his son had been killed. So Indra showered down unseasonally heavy rains. And those rains were so heavy that nobody could move out of those rains. So although Ram was desperate to find Sita, those four months they just couldn't do anything. And then uh, after the four months got over also, nothing seemed to be happening. And then Ram got a little concerned, Ram got a little angry. And when Ram got a little angry, Lakshman got very angry. <laughs> So what happened is Lakshman said, I will go and this ingratitude is the worst of sins. This monkey is living in luxury provided by you but it's forgotten what he meant to do for you. I'll go and destroy him. So Ram told him, Lakshman don't be so impetuous. Just go and find out what is happening. And then he went over there. Initially he was very angry to see Sugreem just living in rebellion. Delighting and sensual pleasures. But then Hanuman and Tara and Sukhivan they told, we have already called for Vandanas. They are coming from different parts of the world and we'll have a huge army assembly of Vandanas and they'll go out and search for Sita. So then, oh, it's true. Nothing is wrong over here. So sometimes it is it takes time to resolve things. It's time to evaluate. Time to time to not just evaluate, time to experience the results of what we've done. And if we persevere, I'll conclude with this point that see, every relationship, there is an expectation and there is a contribution. We, we want, expect the other person to do something and we contribute something in the relationship. So generally, if there is contribution from our side, but the expectation is not fulfilled, that is when the relationships are getting strained. Now, time means that in some relationships, initially we have to put in a lot of contribution. There is not much expectation we can have. We cannot get much reciprocation. It's like a child. When an infant is newborn, the infant is always right. Always right means, let's say the infant at midnight starts crying. You can't say, why are you crying? The infant doesn't have any that sense. Whatever the infant does is right. You, they just have to, everybody else has to orient their world around the infant. But if the infant, uh, if a child is five hours says that midnight I'm hungry, then okay, you can take something in the morning. Or you, should, you, should, you can tell them you should have taken more food at night. 
you can educate them, train them properly. So basically, in the initial stages, we might have to give some time where we make the contribution, but there is not much reciprocation. Our expertise is not being fulfilled. But over a period of time, if it's happening consistently, you know, we are doing something from our side, but there's nothing coming from the other side. Uh, it, might, it might happen that sometimes we may do a lot for some time, and there's nothing coming back. But then afterwards, we get a lot back. You see, Prabhupada, in a one sense, when he was trying to share Krishna Bhakti, for 30-40 for years, he was doing that vigorously in India, and nothing was happening. In the last 10 years, he got, Prabhupada himself said, he got, I got more success than what I expected. It's so the way Krishna consciousness movement spread all over. It was astonishing. So we need to persevere, understanding that things don't just necessarily come back immediately. And sometimes reciprocation might come from a different way than what we expected. Different relationships work at different distances. I mean, some, relate, some people say that you know, I have an excellent relationship with that person. Oh, really? Uh, what do you mean? He says, whenever we meet, we smile at each other. <laughs> okay, that is also one definition of an excellent relationship. <laughs> we never frown at each other when we meet. <laughs> okay. That's also, at, least at that distance, the relationship works very good. But if you come closer, then, so, so different relationships, they work best at different distances. One way of cooperating is also cooperating. <laughs> <laughs> you operate here, I operate here, we cooperate. <laughs> and as long as you're not quarreling with each other, that's fine. If you're, if you're not backbiting or quarreling or criticizing, then that's fine. So different relationships work best at different distances. And time will help us to learn what distance some relationship works the best. And you may say, no, but I invested so much in this relationship and nothing worked out. But it's not like that. See, every relationship helps us to grow. And ultimately, you can say Krishna is reciprocal. There are some people in our lives, we do so much to please them and they're never pleased. And there are some other people, we don't pay them much attention, but they give us so much love and affection and attention and respect. And we don't even notice them. We take them for granted. But instead of taking them for granted, we understand, okay, see, I am I am doing sir, I am giving service, I am giving attention, I am giving affection. Now I expect something similar in return. But sometimes we may not get it from that person alone. So instead of seeing horizontally every relationship is I and this person. You see that relationship, every every relationship that we have is also a part of our relationship with Krishna. Our direct practice of Krishna Bhakti is what connects us with Krishna directly. But how we interact with others also can reflects on how we connect with Krishna. So, so some relationships are such that uh, in those relationships, so whenever we are doing some love, uh, we are doing some, some attention, some affection, some service, ultimately we are not just doing that for that person alone. Because they are part of Krishna, we are doing it for Krishna through them. And if it doesn't work with that person, it might be that we have to have a particular distance in that. But in some other relationship, Krishna will give. If we give love, we will get love. If we give attention and affection and service, we will get it better. But it may not be necessarily through the same channel. So we focus on one relationship, maybe at a time, but we don't reduce our vision to that relationship. It's not that my self-worth is defined only by whether this relationship works or not. I did my part in this relationship. But even if this didn't work, still I, I did it as a mood of as a mood of a service to Krishna and I grew by that. I every like, the courage to trust ultimately comes by looking beyond the horizontal relationship to the vertical relationship. We don't reject these relationships, but we see beyond them. And Dhruva uh, was told by his mother, I cannot satisfy you. I cannot give you a kingdom bigger than your father's. Go to the forest. It is an act of trust on both their parts. For the mother, she is a five-year-old child. To tell the child to go to the forest to search for Vishnu, it requires a lot of courage for the mother to say that. And for the child also, all alone to go in the forest and search for someone who he has never met in. It requires courage. 
And both of them could do that. His mother could also do that because she knew that I am not the ultimate maintainer. She said that she, her love for her son was genuine, but still, it was finite. She said that whatever love I have offered you, millions of mothers like me cannot offer as much love as Vishnu can offer you. Go to Vishnu. So she she did what she could, but then she, there was something, nothing she could do. She didn't reject her son. She directed her son towards her. So this is this is a difference between rejecting and directing. So we, when we are trying to love, connect with someone, we do that as a service to Krishna. But sometimes that doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, that's not necessarily, it could be our fault, it could be the other person's fault, it could just be that sometimes you know, things don't work at all. So we have to keep a particular distance. But see that we can keep connecting with Krishna. And if we are open to that dynamic of connecting with Krishna, Krishna will reciprocate with us. And Krishna will give us the opportunity, He will open the doors. And He will help us find like minded people with whom we can connect and with whom we can move forward. So, this as the alliance of Sugriva and Ram was what reshaped the whole equation, both of them together. They took out the biggest demon of that time. But similarly, for each one of us, when we develop that courage to trust, see vertically that ultimately it is not just, I'm not just relating with this person, I'm ultimately relating with Krishna. Every relationship forces us to come out of ourselves. Whenever I form a relationship with someone, I have to think about the other person. What will this person think? What will please this person? What will displease that person? And as this evolution keeps happening, we start, we start coming out of ourselves, we come out further and further till we become conscious of Krishna. So, it's rather than thinking of these relationships as competitive, they can be competitive, but they can also be complementary. From self-centeredness, we start thinking about others, and ultimately we start thinking about the Supreme Mother, that is Krishna. So that's how, even if a particular relationship or a series of relationships don't seem to work out well, if we are doing our part in a mood of service, then ultimately, a relationship with Krishna will surely work out. So I'll summarize. I spoke on this topic of relationships, wisdom from the Ramayana, between naivety and cynicism is the courage to trust, is trust. So I talked about initially how if within us the emotional faculty is too strong, it's like the accelerator. We move fast without checking the right path. That is naivety. And if the brake is too much applied, then we don't move forward at all. That's cynicism. And we need a balance of both the emotional and the rational in moving forward in relationships. So we talked about uh, about the story in the Ramayana of Vali and Sukhri primarily to understand how both of them had to, uh, rather Sukhri, because of being targeted and threatened by Vali, he became very suspicious and he suspected Ram also. And then I discussed about how anger leads to certainty of conviction which is unhealthy, which is what happened to all. I'm sure I know what's happening. And then I talked about trust, the acronym, for understanding how we can move forward, avoiding the extremes of naivety and cynicism. So T was, what was it? Thank you. Yeah. That means, Initially, we might feel emotionally connected, we might not feel emotionally connected. But think means we apply our intelligence to try to understand, should I move forward or not. Intelligence means to put things in the proper perspective. Don't let us let one perception define everything. Put the perception in context. And then R was? Resolve. Resolve, Resolve means we can't just keep thinking, we have to do something, we have to act. It's only when our thoughts interact with reality then we can check the validity. It's like if a doctor gives a particular diagnosis and a prescription, we have to decide whether I want to take it or not take it. If you just keep hearing the diagnosis and take 100 diagnoses like that, nothing will work. Then you was understand. Understand was where I talked about the frame of reference. You know, sometimes we might, whatever happens to us, we don't have, whatever even other people do to us may not be about us. You don't have to take everything that everyone does too personally. So I talked about we how understanding is to put things in the most constructive frame of reference. I talked about 
a power switch going on, it could escalate it to the level of solar flares. So it could be downgraded just a switch turn off, be turned off. So similarly, uh, different people can have different currencies in which they trade. And we need to understand their currency. So we understand by two things. What is it that they complain most about? What is it they appreciate most? And then S was step forward. Step forward means once we have understood which, which frame of reference they are coming from, then tangibly start com com committing and contributing to their relationship. And as we keep doing this, things start becoming clearer whether something is going to work or not. And the last is time. Time means we learn through the passage of time whether a particular, th a particular thing is going to work or we, we find out the right distance at which a particular relationship works. And even if a particular relation doesn't work so well, if we have done our part, then Krishna will reciprocate. So we don't just see the relationship as just be connecting with other person. We see it as a part of our evolution, spiritual evolution. Every relationship forces us to come out of ourselves. And the more we come out of ourselves, the more we can ultimately reach Krishna. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. We have some time for questions. Yes. So how to overcome, is it false finding or fault finding habit? False finding. False, like fault, fault, fault finding. Okay, false yes. Finding. So how do we overcome the fault finding habit? Firstly, you see one of the best ways or one of the most tricky ways in the fault finding attitude tricks us is by making us think we are very intelligent. <laughs> so I am so intelligent. I can find this fault. Everybody respects this person, but they are so naive. Hey, I can see faults which nobody can see. So to find faults, is it intelligent? Well, it could be, but in Kali Yuga especially, uh, finding fault requires as much intelligence as is required to find water in an ocean. Kaler dosho nidhe rajan. Kaliva is an ocean of faults. So in an ocean, how much intelligence is required to find a fault? <laughs> well, it's there everywhere. If at all, if we, we can find some land, that's how we can get some shelter over there. So finding faults is, does not require any intelligence in that sense. I mean, it requires intelligence, but finding faults is not necessarily a sign of intelligence. So the way I put it is, you, if you can't give up our fault-finding mentality, we can use to find faults with the fault-finding mentality. You can use it to find faults with the fi fault-finding mentality. What does it give me? Does it lead me to anything constructive? So it only alienates people, it only, uh, it only makes me feel superior but it doesn't really connect me with others. So, now having said that, so consciously we try to look for the good in others. And I did an exercise in, in Brisbane when we had this retreat. So, you could do this later at your home also. One of the, there's a saying in the Rig Veda that uh, the prayer, rather, whoever I meet, let my first thought about that person be positive. Whoever I meet, let my first thought about that person be positive. So what we could do is that whoever we tend to find a lot of faults about, we consciously sit down, take some time, and we will write down three or five good qualities about that person. And try to keep that in mind. So especially when we are going to interact with someone, some interactions, Interacting with some people is like is like going for a walk in a beautiful garden. We enjoy it. But interacting with someone is like walking into a landmine. We don't know what we say caught what explosion. So <laughs> we all have people like that. So, <laughs> so when we know that some people are like that, the interactions tend to be very dense. Then before we go into that interaction, we will look at that list and, and, and try to think about the positive quality. 
at least one positive one. See, all of us, <laughs> our mind is constantly giving a running commentary about the people around us. <laughs> See this person? Forgetful. This person? Untidy. This person? Arrogant. This person? Insensitive. Mm -hmm. So like that, we all, our mind has ready labels to fix on everyone. Now at one level, if certain people have certain limitations, knowing about that is important. Say if somebody is forgetful, then if something is very important which has to be brought or to be done, then we, 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 we cannot rely on them for that. Or we have to we specifically remind them about it. So what happens is that we can't, in the name of not finding faults, we cannot be blind. But say, say for example, this is a sheet of paper. Now, if this sheet of paper is here, and I, I am looking at you, so I can look at the paper and I can look at you also. But if the sheet of paper comes so close to me, it's, so I can't see you except this paper. Now, if this paper were transparent, then I could see you, but only through this paper. So what happens, we all have opinions about others. So now we can't, we can't wish away or reject our opinions, our perceptions, our impressions. They are all there. What we can do is hold your impressions lightly, not tightly. Keep them at a distance. Yes, I, uh, based on my past experience, yeah, this person is very, is very critical. This person is very sentimental. This person is like this. Now we can't, uh, we can't reject whatever labels the mind is putting. But what we could do is that don't put it as a fixed label, which is the filter through which you are seeing everything. Yeah, this is my experience with this person, but maybe, uh, maybe this person has other attributes also which I don't know. See what happens when we reduce people to labels, then, then the the adventure in that relationship goes out, because every relationship is like an adventure. You now we we discover what the person is like, we discover what the person is not like. But if you fix a label, then they may have some good, we'll never discover that because we'll see everything with a filter. So three things I said. First is that recognize the fault finding mentality itself doesn't lead to any. We have to look at the faults in the fault finding mentality. Because there's no intelligence, special intelligence required to find fault. Don't we don't succumb to that temptation. Second is that we write down some good qualities with the other person, which we can uh, consciously remind ourselves of before interacting with them. And then, if we have some negative opinions about them, we can't deny them, but we don't let them overwhelm our perception of them. We don't keep them so close that we can't see that person except through that fault. Yes, this is there, but it's like a functional thing. I don't have to make it like a very personal, unchangeable label fixed on them. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any, any other questions? Yes. Prabhu, the one thing, uh, you know, we say Adav Sraddha, mm -hmm. you know, foundation, the very first point, starting point for Bhakti Sraddha. And uh, that leads us to incline towards the naivete, you know, side of things that, okay, forget about okay. everything and then you, 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 you keep yourself as naivete. Just, you know, you said, you know, emotions are carried away. It's too much of break, I mean, uh, accelerator. So, Adav Sraddha. On the other side, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, use your intelligence. As soon as I start using my intelligence, I start reasoning. As you said, you know, it mm -hmm. leads to more reasoning. That you, you, you want to find the rationale of everything, what is happening around you. So now I think that, okay, I am chanting for so long and uh, nothing is happening. Krishna is not looking at me. I can't see Krishna personally. I cannot see the, the proof that Krishna exists. Everything is in the scripture. These are the reasoning mm -hmm. side of it. Okay. The other side. How do I balance between the two? Okay, good question. So, Shraddha, will it, which is the first requirement of Bhakti, faith, will that lead to naivety? And if you start using reason, doubts start coming in. I think doubts are also a sign of intelligence. You know, it's like a, a small child sees some advertisement and believes it. That's why in many countries there are restrictions about, you cannot target advertisements for, uh, uh, for children who are very small. Recently, I, there's a new word that has come up. There's, there's, there's pornography, there is bornography. 
Pornography means children who are newborn, all the media that target is them. <laughs> <laughs> is that real, Prabhu? <laughs> well, it's a, there is a, it's called neologism. Neologism is a new word that has come up. It's not even like a mainstream circulation. But there is, there's a lot of targeting for children who haven't developed any critical faculty. What do they say? Believe it, like infants. Oh, you know, buy this toy, play with this, get this, get that. But there are definitely restrictions on what uh, can be targeted, at what age ads can be used for targeting people. So when people are a little older, uh, hopefully, they have a little critical faculty so they don't believe in whatever they see. So we do need, actually, spiritual life requires a certain amount of cynicism. Because at one level, as you said, uh, you say, how can I believe something which I don't see? Okay, that's, that's a good question. But spiritual life requires not just faith that something exists beyond what I see. Spiritual life requires also doubt. That what I see is not the way things are. So it requires, sometimes atheists say we are skeptics. We don't believe the way religious people, religious people believe. But actually religious people are skeptical. Skeptical that the world as it appears is not what it actually is. So, it, it, so skepticism also required, no doubt. Oh, other, if we start believing whatever we see, we feel the world has so much pleasure. Why should I think about something else? But the world's pleasures are temporary. You have to see beyond, it requires intelligence. So, we don't have to think that it's like reasoning will lead to doubts about spirituality. Rather, reasoning can, reasoning can lead to doubts about materialism also. And the doubts about materialism are required to practice spirituality. So in that sense, the reasoning faculty can be used. I did a seminar for uh, IIT students, students in India. So we were talking about atheism and theism. So I said that I don't, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. <laughs> 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 so what do you mean by that? That basically, if you look at atheism, what is the life story of the universe? Life story of the universe would be that nothing existed because of nothing. Nothing exploded because of nothing. And gave rise to everything. That is spectacularly rational. <laughs> so, atheism also requires a significant amount of faith. Yeah. Uh, so atheism also requires faith that from matter consciousness came, from nothing everything came, from a disorder order came, from an explosion construction came, and none of these things we have seen anywhere. So we require faith over there also. So faith is required in every, every walk of life. Even materialism requires faith, spirituality requires faith. So what we need to do is, if we have doubts, we direct them properly. So if we tend to get a lot of questions, we need to associate with devotees who can answer those questions. Not, uh, that's a really like-minded devotees. Not all devotees will be able to answer those questions. So we have to find out <coughs> who are the devotees who are also having that rational faculty. More. So I had a lot of questions since the start of my bhakti. I was introduced in Pune and I was traveling with one of my spiritual guides to Mumbai and we were going in the train and I said, can I ask you some questions? I said, yes. And at that time I had like six full scale papers oh filled God. with questions. I said, how many questions do you have? I said, 189 questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course we finished only like 12 questions in the three hours, but in four hours. But anyway, the point is that I had a lot of questions and I had to search, not that just the devotee whom we are introduced, who introduces us, they will to answer all our questions. So if, if the rational faculty is higher than us, we can contact those, to, can try to seek out those devotees who can get answers to our, your answers to our questions. At the second point, so on my website, you know, there are almost like 6,000 questions have been answered, thespiritualscientist.com. I said a lot of my books also, they behind have question answer books. So you can find out the resources. And third thing is that reason sh should be our minister, not our master. In our spiritual path, reason is important, but it's like a king has a minister, 
So reason is a mystery. I use my reason to understand things. But in every walk of life, we go beyond reason to do things. Even in science, which claims to be rational, quantum physics, actually it just doesn't make sense. Quantum physics holds that everything is just waveforms. There is no such solid particle over here. It just waves, and when I observe, then the waves collapse to form an object. Einstein was very skeptical about quantum physics. He said, I would like to believe that the moon continues to exist even if I'm not looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> now, he said, that's common sense. Right? The moon exists, so quantum physics says it doesn't exist. So, quantum physics requires a lot of faith. There's another quantum physicist, Paul Dirac, he said that if you think you have understood quantum physics, that is proof that you have not understood quantum physics. <laughs> So, science also requires faith. Now, you could say that faith is reasonable because there are models and the models work, but it is faith. They, they don't use the word faith, they use the word assumptions. But essentially, it's the same thing. That we make certain uh, propositions about the, nature, about the nature of the things that are unknown to us. That's the essence. What do you faith mean? But that which is unknown to me, I make some hypothesis about what is what is the nature of the unknown. But science also does that, and spiritual also does that. So scientists, it's not that they're, when they're using quantum physics, they're not irrational. But they understand the rationality, we don't understand all of quantum physics. But we use it and we get some rational results by that. So similarly, we may not be able to understand all of spirituality by rationality. But the major spiritual truths, they don't make sense probably. And if some specific things don't make sense, then Jiva Swami says that that the inconceivability of the absolute proves the transcendence of the absolute. That means, he says, if we could understand the supreme with our intelligence, then our intelligence would become supreme. So that means there will always be some things about the Supreme which you will not be able to understand. And that's not a that's not a irrationality. So you could say there is irrational, there is rational, and there is transrational. So spirituality is not irrationality, it is transrationality. We accept rationality. There are many things which is spirituality which are more rational than materials. But there are some things which need us to go beyond rationality. So if we keep a reason as our minister, not our master, then we can move forward. Thank you. Oh, one more question allowed. Yes. Does anyone else have any question right now? Okay, yes. Let me know and stop with this question. Yeah. So Prabhu, at the end of Bhagavad Gita, you know, uh, we, we have seen Arjuna saying, you know, I mean Krishna saying, Sarva Dharman Paritya Jamaame comes from So you abandon all varieties of religion and surrender them to me. That's the final one. Now, uh, when we look at uh, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, uh, you know, Arjuna was, condemned, you know, he, he had many, many reasons mm -hmm. not to fight and then hundreds and series of questions using his intelligence, whatever he had, to question Krishna. So, uh, does that mean that Krishna is saying that, you know, you don't, you should just stop thinking, stop applying your rationale, stop no, applying... Your... No, no. Arjuna had hundreds of... Uh, Arjuna had, you know, in the, in the beginning of from chapter okay. 2.7 onwards, you know, the, yeah, yeah, okay. The, so, it says there no, are hundreds fine, yeah, and series of questions that's fine, yeah. he asked as a, as a, as a disciple of Okay, yeah, that's true. But uh, at the final hour, you know, Krishna says, you know, you abandon everything, surrender unto me. So my question is, okay. does, is Krishna encouraging through Arjuna to all of us to abandon our thought process, to abandon our rationality thinking, to abandon our kind of applying <coughs> reasoning <coughs> through our intelligence? <coughs> And uh, surrendering into So when Krishna says Sarodharma and Paritya, is he telling us to abandon our rationality and thinking process and just surrender to him? Uh, I would say no and yes. No in the sense if that was what was the only thing Krishna was telling us, Krishna could have just given a one verse Bhagavad Gita. Isn't it? Arjuna asked with Chamita on Dharma Samur Jeta. I am asking what is Dharma? As 2.7 and 2.8, Krishna would have said, Sarvam Sarvama and Prithi Mami Kam Shadam. So, Bhavita would have got over it. <laughs> so, Krishna doesn't do that. In fact, 
and then there is 1866, 1866, but before that we have 1863, which is Vimri Shaita Tashi, Shainri Yathe and deliberate deeply on what I have said, and then do as you desire. So Krishna is actually not just calling, do this, don't do this. One of my friends is also quite a scholarly devotee. He was saying he is trying to write a book, the Ten Commandments of the Bhagavad Gita. So, like in the Bible, there are Ten Commandments. I said, please don't write a book like that. I said, why? I said, the Bhagavad Gita's mood is not the mood of giving commandments. The Bhagavad Gita's mood is of choices and consequences. You do this, this will happen. You do this, this will happen. Now you decide what you want to do. That's why Vimrishyata Dashi Shini Tejista that deliberate and decide what you want to do. Now, after that, Arjuna becomes deeply lost in thought. Then, so it's like, see, there is, at one level, we have to give people options. But at another level, we also have to give recommendation. It's like, nowadays, uh, in the medical profession, sometimes the doctors are very fearful that they might be sued. I was in Australia, I was staying at a doctor's house and he was telling me that on average, a doctor gets a court case at least every three years against them. So he said, I was serving for 30 years, I got around 10 cases against me. So now the point is, a doctor might have to be very careful when they give some recommendation. But imagine if a doctor, if a patient is sick, and the patient goes to the doctor and the doctor says, you have these symptoms, these five symptoms, that they can indicate this disease. And if this is a disease, for this, uh, these are the five possible treatments. You can take this tablet, you can take this injection, you can take this intravenous, you can do this. And these five symptoms can also, like, uh, you know, can also mean this disease. And if this disease, you can have these five treatments over there. So like this doctor says, there can be five possible diseases, and 25 possible treatments. Now you decide what you want to teach. <laughs> how will how will the patient decide? <laughs> now the doctor also has to take an assertive position to do this. Yeah, if you just give options. Actually, you know, we all people talk about freedom, freedom to choose. Freedom to choose is important, but you know, too many choices can overload. Suppose you know you want to send a message to someone on the phone and you open your WhatsApp or something and immediately first you ask what font do you want to use? <laughs> you know, what color font do you want to use? What size font do you want to use? Do you want to italics or standard? And if you just go into the preferences, sometimes they give 25 specifications about the font itself. And it, after for every message, if you have to select all the 25 options, you will not be able to do anything at all, isn't it? So certain things are set as default preferences. So, as I said, so option without recommendation doesn't work. So, Krishna gives the, the, the philosophical worldview by which Arjuna can choose. And he asks Arjuna to choose. But then, when he says, Sarvadharma and Pratyajya, you could say that is, a, that is a very strong recommendation that Krishna is giving to Arjuna. So, that is out of his compassion. It's not rejection of, rejection of uh, Arjuna's intelligence or a call to Arjuna to reject intelligence. So, you could say that. If Krishna had given Sarvadharma Pratyajya as a one verse response to the Bhagavad Gita, that would have been a rejection of his rationality. That would have been, could say, irrational. Just give rationality and surrender him. But the whole Bhagavad Gita is a rational book. In practically nowhere in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is telling Arjuna, do what I am telling you to do because I am God. He does say that I am God. And he does say this is what you should do. But he doesn't put the suit together and say, because I am God, so you should do this. That is not the mood of the Bhagavad Gita. Okay. So the whole Bhagavad Gita is a very soundly reasoned book, which is personally Arjuna on certain thing. But then at the end, when he is calling to this, that is not rejection of rationality, but rejection of dependence on rationality. We don't let rationality become our master, but it's a minister. See, all this makes sense, but it, uh, but. Uh, see, facts and actions, there is not necessarily one path from there. What is 
and what should be done. So for example, somebody says that oh, I lost my job and I have only one uh, savings enough for three months now. So now what should you do based on that? So the fact is I have only three months saving remaining. Now from that you can say that oh I should start full time searching for a job so that I can find it before I get three months. Or the job market is very tough. So I use two months say that I have to do some new course and then I search for one month. Or but this three months saving, I'll invest somewhere. At least I'll have some returns, I'll do something. So you could have many different options. So very different course. So basically, the, from the facts to actions, there is no one linear essential path. So you, they, from the same set of facts, different people can infer different courses of action. And all of them can be reasonable. That's why what Krishna is doing is, there is a time when we, every one of us has to take a leap of faith. But that leap of faith is not by the, is not by rejecting rationality. There is a foundation of rationality from which we take the leap of faith. It's like if there is no solid ground, if the ground below is slippery or marshy and from that I try to leap. I can't leap at all, it's sinking over there. Now the ground is sound, but even when the ground is sound, that will not take me to the sky. I have to take a leap. So for us, rationality is like a solid ground. So what Krishna is doing throughout the Bhagavad Gita is, till 18.63, he is building the ground. Arjuna, do you want to leap? And if you want to leap, this is how you should leap. Sarva Dharma and Okay? Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada.